Hey everybody, welcome to Creative Live. I am the head of the music and audio channel, Finn McKenty. If you're new to Creative Live, we're the world's leading online classroom for creative professionals. We have classes in songwriting, engineering, mixing, mastering, anything else that goes into making music, taught by people like Al, Joey Sturgis, Andrew Wade, Periphery, Between the Buried Me, Dillinger Escape Plan, and lots of other people that you probably like. So uh, if you are watching Creative Live for the first time, then after this, head up to creativelive.com slash audio and check out what we have to offer. Lots of free previews there. Uh, the way that this works is that this is your chance to ask Al questions live on air. You type, we ask. So Al and I are gonna chit chat for a little bit. Uh, while we do that, go over to the right hand side of this page uh, and over there you'll see a place where you can ask questions. So just type them in there and I will ask the best ones for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, so uh, Al, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And I just gotta say kudos to you guys when you go down that list of everyone you've had on there for how long this channel's been around. It's super impressive. Yeah, you know? it's pretty cool. I mean, uh, yeah, who, who would have thought? Here we are. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a great list. Yeah. Uh, well, what, uh, what have you been up to lately? What's keeping you busy the past week or two? Past week or two, I've been super busy with planning the next boot camp, which is going to be in Detroit at 37 Studios, myself and Joey Sturges giving people 40 hours of intense real world how to record knowledge, as well as my podcast, uh, Joey Sturges Forum podcast that we just launched maybe a month and a half ago. Those two things have been taking up all my time. Yeah, well, let me, let's back up a little bit. Um, Tell, tell everybody exactly what your boot camps are and uh, where they can go to find out more about them. Okay, you can go to unstoppablerecordingmachine.com to find out more. Uh, the boot camps basically sprung up because lots of people who actually saw my creative live courses would email me and say that they would love to learn from me in person or do something you know that was just like longer. And so I figured why not try to get the most motivated of the students together in one place and give them a walkthrough from pre-pro all the way through mixing of how it's done in real life in a studio situation with a signed artist or a popular artist that they look up to. So and that's, go ahead. Oh, uh, I guess just to kind of summarize it. So it's a chance for them to get in the studio with you and you know some some uh, various guests, artists, and producers, people you know, a chance to get in the studio for what? How are they? Th they're three days usually. Four days now. Four days. We bumped okay. it up to forty hours, four days, so and it's, it's myself and Joey Sturges giving so you, the class. You, Joey, and and whoever else uh, you know happens to be part of it in the studio with you guys for for four days to really see how it's done, uh, you know, hands on and in person. Yeah, I feel like there's a limit to what you can get from learning in a school or online because you're not going to actually get to experience the bar right there in front of your face, in front of your, you know, in your ears. You're not going to actually get to know what it means to track at the highest level or mix at the highest level. So we try to give them that, uh, give them an experience. They're not going to, they're not going to walk away from neutral. Basically. Yeah, I know for me, like one of the most eye-opening experiences that I had. Um, you know, one of the cool parts of this job is that I, I get, you know, my hands on all kinds of sessions from the best in the world. And, you know, we have some of the best musicians in the world come in here and track and stuff. And that was like so eye opening for me just to, to get my hands on those, on the stems or sessions or whatever and go, oh, wow, this is, this is what excellence looks like. I thought it was here, but it's here. You know, just to like see what excellence actually looks like in person, and uh, I, I think there's like no real substitute for that. There, there is none because where else is someone going to learn that if they're not surrounded by people who operate at that level? How will the up and coming producer ever even know that that's the standard if all they're recording are local yokels or whatever? There's no, there's no way that they'll possibly know that that's the standard because. Nobody around them operates at that standard. So this is a good replacement for the old school mentoring system that's now dead. 
Cool. Well, uh, yeah, and, and I guess uh, before we get to the questions, maybe tell everybody a little bit about uh, the Joey Sturgis Forum podcast. What you know, who's involved with that? What kinds of stuff you guys are talking about, and uh, and where they can get more? Okay, you can go to jsfpodcast.com, sign up for a free subscription or a premium one. It's up to you. But basically, myself, Joey Sturgis, and Joel Wynasek, who is a total wizard producer mixer, got together and decided that we were going to release our multi-hour long conversations about recording and mixing in the industry for the public to consume. Uh, and we release them about five times a month. We have special guests on there like Andrew Wade. Uh, we've got Bob Katz coming up. Dan Corneff came on. And we try to cover as much ground as we can, but rather than just being all technical stuff, we try to, you know, infuse a lot of our own personal experience uh, with anything that we're talking about. So we go everywhere from anecdotal stuff to actual technical, you know, five steps to being sure. able to get your kick drum to sound good or whatever. Cool. Well, let's get into the questions. Uh, let's spe do it. Speaking of kick drums, a uh, question from VD84. How important is the room for drum recording in the metalcore genre when there is a lot of close miking and sampling going on? Uh, all right. Um, I'm sorry. I was wondering if that related to kick drums. But how important is the oh, room? Well, I guess the it doesn't room? really relate to kick drums. Well, you can, you can explain how it does, but yeah. Talk, okay, talk, about, well, talk about the room if you're going to be editing and, and, and sample replacing and all that stuff. Does the room still matter? Uh, well, the room matters almost zero when it comes to a kick drum. But yes, it does matter a lot when it comes to the overall sound of the kit, even if you are replacing. And now, mind you, that doesn't mean that it has to be the room that you recorded. It could be a tune track room, for instance. They have great rooms. But you're never going to get the right depth out of the drums without the room processing in there. Uh, everything is going to sound very, very short and uh, maybe punchy, but more like short and dry. Uh, so the room gives it the overall depth. Now, the big challenge with fast music is that you put too much room on there and everything starts to sound like a wash. So you have to be very, very uh, careful with your EQ choices to get rid of the frequencies that start to really, really build up and to cut out all the crap that you really just don't need in the rooms and use them very sparingly. And then the other thing that's very useful is to trigger room samples off of the snare, for instance, so that you get room when you want room, uh, like for instance on a big snare hit that you want you, if you want the snare hit to be longer than the actual direct mic, but you don't want it to be a big reverb tail, well, that comes from room. So uh, you can have that loud and process separately than like your quote-unquote room tracks. So you, you just have to be careful, but if you eliminate them all together, uh, you, know, you might end up with a really small and short drum sound. Cool. Uh, question from Zach V. I've seen Al talk a bit here and there regarding using the Little Labs Red Eye to track slash reamp guitars. I'd like to hear from the man himself the definitive way to track and reamp guitars using the Red Eye Axe Effects and an interface. Uh, well, see, I don't use an Axe Effects, uh, but it's really, really simple. Um, if you're going to track, then you use the end of the red eye that takes the DI in and plug your guitar into the red eye. And then it's got two outs, the back. One of them you send to a preamp, uh, which is the DI signal. The other one goes into the ax effects and you record out of that. So you're recording two simultaneous signals. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know what the red eye is, can you explain what it is and if there are any other alternatives, other products people might be familiar with? Little Labs is just a really great company, and they make a box called the Red Eye, which is a DI slash reamp box. It does both, and it's got amazing, an amazing amount of headroom and just a crystal clear signal. It's not a tone suck like a lot of DI boxes, and it's not a tone suck like a lot of reamp boxes. So it performs both functions very well. I'm sure that a lot of guys who try reamping will notice that something gets lost in translation between when you output 
the signal from your converters or your interface to the reamp box to the head or your ax effects or whatever, something gets lost. I've noticed that with the red eye, there less gets lost. Something always gets lost, but um, less gets lost. So yeah, that's how I would record in and out. I would you just set an output on your converters and send it to the other side of the red eye, switch it into reamp mode, and then into the axe effects like normal. Uh, Very simple process. Question about, and uh, if you're interested in that, you can learn more from uh, Andrew Wade's Recording Rock Guitars class on Creative Live. He goes into that uh, in quite a bit of depth, does a, a demo of all that. So check that out if you're interested. Uh, question about mastering. When you bounce out a mix, getting ready to master, around what dB are you? Are your mixes usually before mastering? So in other words, how much headroom do you have on your master bus uh, You know, on your pre-master? OK, this is a topic with a lot of, uh, lots of opinions on this. Uh, and I don't try to keep things at any one level uh, i try to do it with my ears but as a general rule of thumb mastering engineers like to have six to ten db of headroom to play with if you give them less than that they might they might uh they might get mad at you and i know some people like to go the other way and leave like 20 db or something on the master bus is there any uh, benefit to that uh, not not that i know of I, I, don't, I don't know why, what the point of that is. <laughs> well, more bits is better, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it makes a difference. I, I just know that the guys I've worked with want 6 to 10. So yeah. Give them 6 to 10. So this is an interesting question. Um, curious to hear what you think of it. Uh, hey, Al, do you think that solo artists can work in metal, metalcore, deathcore, etc.? Yeah, of course they can. Um, it, there's a lot of ways for a solo artist to get somewhere in any genre. I guess what I'm wondering is, does he mean a solo artist like, say, Ola England, who also ended up joining a band? Um, or like Keith Marrow, who ended up joining a band, but also who do their own thing? Or do they mean like the older school, like Michelangelo, <laughs> guitar, <laughs> lead guitar player guy? Yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know, but I guess I'm curious what, you, you know, the way I was thinking about that was like the older school one, like, you know, I mean, Devin Townsend is probably the only example I can think of off the top of my head who makes that work in metal. There's probably some other ones I'm not thinking of. Well, I think that nowadays, the, I don't know about the older school model of that, but I think that nowadays the model that proves to be successful for a solo artist is the Ola England, Keith Merrow model of finding a way to become popular on your own via the internet and then using that to get into a band um, while maintaining your solo career. So just build a brand as an artist and then use that to open the door to other opportunities such as playing with a band. Yeah, exactly. I think that the older school model is a lot harder to pull off these days because you still have to have musicians to, you know, so if you want to just start from zero with a full-fledged band, as a solo artist, it's going to be very, very hard to keep musicians that are competent because what are you going to pay them with? It's a lot easier to go the Ola England Keith Marrow approach, which is gain your notoriety, use that to land a good spot. Uh, question about my favorite topic, bass drops. Uh, how do you go about side chaining the A weight drops so it doesn't take away from the music? So first of all, do you side chain them? And I guess just in general, can you talk about how you work with bass drops? Okay. Uh, yes, sometimes I will side chain them to the mix. Uh, basically, the idea is that you don't want to interfere with the sub drop too much, and then you don't want the mix to interfere with sub drop too much either so sometimes and i find this to be pretty effective i'll take things like sub drops and i won't put them into the master bus along with the music they'll go parallel to the music and that way when that master bus compression or stereo bus compression depending on how you, what you want to call it um when it kicks in it's not destroyed by the overwhelming low end. So that's, that's one thing. And then, yeah, sometimes I do add a sidechain 
I'll put a like say a multi band compressor on the low end of the mix. Like say if you separate the low end of the mix to one channel, uh, I'll put a multi band on that, and then you know everything from eighty and below will be will be compressed when the sub drop hits. Uh, sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes, uh, if you are doing a mix where you have your bass separated into, you know, low and high, sometimes you just got to side chain the low end of the bass guitar so that it doesn't get in the way. But really at the end of the day, no matter how you do it, the idea is that nothing is interfering with the sub drop. So that, and by side chaining, you don't have to turn it up very loud because when you turn it up very loud, that's when mixes and stereo systems start to get destroyed and mastering compressors. A uh, question from uh, Milton. Uh, Al, what is your opinion about ribbon mics for drum overheads? Would you recommend using both ribbons and small diaphragm condensers at the same time? Uh, how would you avoid phase cancellation in this case? And thank you. Okay. Uh, normally the ribbons I use, I like to use them for rooms, actually. Um, I find that for overheads in this genre, um, and let me just say in this genre of heavy music, I like small diaphragm condensers as my overheads because they capture detail very, very well. They don't really color the sound too much. Uh, and they take to EQ very nicely, especially the KM84s which I love. I've noticed whenever I start to use quote unquote vibier, more colored microphones, uh, ribbon mics, tube mics, larger diaphragm condensers, they sound cool when you're listening to the drums by themselves, but there's so much extra coloration going on that when things get real busy, that coloration will become your enemy. Uh, I prefer to maintain as much control as possible. So now I don't use ribbons very often as overheads on metal projects, heavy projects. But you know, if you're recording another style of music that's much roomier and vibier in nature, they can be fantastic. So, you know, I think all all that just has to be context appropriate. And how to avoid phase, well, uh, you have to be very, very mindful of it. I always start by measuring the distance from both overheads to the snare, you know, the the making sure that they're the exact same distance. And then I do the same thing with the rooms so that at least we have a starting point. They never actually stay there because you always have to be, you always end up having to tweak the distances a little. But at least you start from a point of equidistance from the snare and just go from there. Uh, use your ears and record some and look at the waveforms. And you can see are they out of phase or are they not out of phase? And then move microphones. Till they till they're in phase, it's really easy. You just have to put in put in the work. Cool. Um, question from Austin Schaefer: When setting up amp tones, do you like to crank the mids or scoop them a bit? Sometimes I hear people say they love mids. Other people talk about cutting them like crazy with EQ. What's your take? Well, to say I love or hate mids is like saying I love or hate. 1k it's like uh you need 1k to be able to understand people speaking and you need it to be able to really understand guitar riffs uh because those mids are where you get the majority of your note information now the problem is if you jack the mids too high things definitely start to sound a little bit like this so um i think that if you're going with an amp like an actual amplifier with a microphone um, like an SM57, for instance, then you already know that that microphone has a mid bump in it. So you might want to compensate for that with the way that you dial the amp. But I don't, I don't like to subscribe to any rules of I love mids or I hate mids or scoop this or scoop that. It's always context appropriate. And I think that is subscribing to any of those notions before you actually start working on the tone is kind of dumb. Uh, I like the idea of set the controls, I mean, set the dials to the middle and uh, see what you've got and go from there. Well, I mean, and plus there's all the, the other components to the, the tone besides the, 
the controls and the amp, you know, the tuning and strings and player and guitar and the song and style of music and all those other 900 million things that you got to think about before you think about EQ. Absolutely. Um, I, I definitely think that EQ is the last thing. And I think that a really, really good guitar tone anyways uh, doesn't, isn't going to need too much EQ in the end. But you do need to know what the characteristics are of the microphone that you're using versus the amp that you're using. Another guitar question for you. Uh, you mentioned that you don't use an AxeFX. Have you used a Kemper profiling amp? What are your thoughts on these type of guitar processors? Uh, and if you prefer real amps, what are, your, what are a few of your favorite go-to amps? Well, got this right here. So, yeah. I that's use that's an AxeFX, right? <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the new model. <laughs> it's the white one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had I had an Axe Effects, but I sold it when I got my Kemper. I've got nothing against the Axe Effects. I just find more use out of the Kemper. Um, now, one thing that I think is misleading about the Kemper, and this is not on Kemper's end. I just think this is how the how the hype has basically evolved. Is people think that it models amplifiers, and that's only part of the truth. Um, I think that what it does is it models specific tones. Like it's, it's capturing a specific moment in time. This guitar player through this amp with this tone at, the, at this point in time is what's getting modeled. It's not modeling every single little tone possibility out of the amp. So just because you got a killer 5150 tone on some record and you modeled it doesn't mean you have a 5150 inside of this digital unit. You have a you know, a digital recreation of that one tone that you got. And you'll notice with the profiles is once you start going too far, like trying to dial the gain back on them or too high on them or, you know, mess with it too much, uh, it starts to get weird. Uh, so I like to use the Kemper in conjunction with some really badass real amps. And my go-tos are my Bogner Ecstasy, Soldano Avenger, 5153 and an original block le letter 5150. I think those are the ones that I tend to use the most. Well, you know, one, one thing I wanted to kind of pick up on there that you mentioned about the Kemper is that it's a snapshot of a tone that worked in that particular session with that particular player and guitar and song and style and all those other things. Yep. I remember I, I had you reamp a, a, a song of mine a, a while ago with a tone on an album that you did that I absolutely loved. It's one of the best guitar tones I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and you reamped my DI with it and it sounded like complete dog shit because yeah, it was exactly. me playing guitar on a different guitar, different tuning, different genre of music, different everything else. And, I was, and then I, I felt stupid afterwards because I was like, oh yeah, why would that work? So, you know, Kemper is great for taking a snapshot of a thing that's working at that moment, but don't think that if you download the, you know, if you somehow come across a Kemper tone from your favorite album that everything you play through it is going to sound like your favorite album. Yeah, there's so many other factors involved. I remember exactly what tone you're talking about, too, and that guitar player on that record that you love so much is phenomenal. He would sound great through a practice amp. Right. Like, anything he touches sounds great. It is a really good profile, but it's not going to just work. I, I just think that people think that if they get somebody's profiles on a Kemper, that suddenly they're going to sound like that guy, and it's just not true. I wish it was that simple. Yeah, me too. Then we'd all be making $8 million a year doing this. Question about vocals. Uh, I've got time for about two more here. Uh, I okay. record vocals with a Shure uh, S7B straight into a Universal Audio Apollo Twin Duo. A lot of people say a preamp like a cloud lifter is very needed, yet I don't really notice any problem in doing it my way. Is that because the converters in the UA are really good, or am I really missing out on something here? Okay. First of all, cloud lifter is not really a preamp. So, uh, yeah, I, if it was between just plugging into an Apollo or you know my Apogee Quartet or something like that, that's got decent converters and decent onboard pre's. Yeah, sure, I'd use that. But if you're asking whether or not going with the stock converters and preamps on, you know, a prosumer unit like the Apollo versus like an API preamp, 
through and then through a real good outboard compressor, well, that's going to win. I, ju- I don't think that with the cloud lifter, you're going to notice too much of a difference between how you're doing it. So, you know, if you like the way you're doing it, just keep doing what you're doing. If you actually do want to upgrade, then you need to look into a real preamp and a real outboard compressor. Warm Audio makes really, really good API knockoffs. Um, they're, I don't want to call them cheap. I'll just call them inexpensive because they're very, very good and very reasonably priced. But if you, yeah, if you are looking for a measurable upgrade in recording quality for your vocals, don't mess with a cloud lifter. Get a real preamp. All right. One last question. Uh, the style is doom, and the goal is to attain definition between baritone guitars and the bass. Especially with dealing with guitar rooms, they tend to add a lot in the low end and then get, tend to get totally droney. Any special tips? So basically, you, you know, baritone guitars, bass, lots of stuff going on the low end. How do you manage all that? Through very, very careful and crafty EQ. And one thing that you should always remember about low end instruments is that they're defined by their high end. For instance, say that you turn off your speakers and you just listen to a sub, uh, most of the time you won't be able to recognize what instrument that is, unless if it's a kick drum, it's going <laughs> right? You'll notice that because of the rhythm. But like, besides that, in general, you can't really tell what's going on uh, below 100. You just know that there's some sort of nondescript low end stuff happening so uh to really really get clarity out of low end instruments you have to look at how they're represented up top and so with the bass lots of times you get the definition out of the bass by making sure that the low end isn't unruly meaning you have like a multi-band compressor on it and you don't you know 60 hertz isn't just obliterating everything but you want to get really really good EQ and separation between the mids, the mids and the highs of the instruments. That's how you'll really be able to notice more separation between them. And then also you're just going to have to play around with the high pass on all the instruments to just see where they play nice. But, you know, th- this is actually the hardest part about mixing is getting that low end to not, you know, just getting it to play nice. Sometimes it happens in five minutes. Sometimes it takes two weeks. So pretty sure that yeah. you addressed this in detail in your mastering metal mixing class. So if yes. anyone wants to know more about this, check that class out. Yeah, I, I actually did go into it quite in detail on a band that tuned down to F. So uh, I definitely do think, though, that drony or not drony, um, the 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 thing you have to do is make sure that you're not getting too much buildup in any one area. So if the guitar is pushing 60 and the bass is pushing 60 and the kick drum is pushing 60, you might have a little bit too much 60. So you just got to play around and see, you know, make the puzzle pieces fit together with the low end. It takes a while. Cool. Well, we're out of time, but uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, if you want to learn you. more about Ale's boot camps, go to unstoppablerecordingmachine.com. If you want to check out uh, the podcast he's doing with uh, Joey Sturgis and Joel. How do I say Joel's last name? Wanasek. Wanasek. Uh, go to jsfpodcast.com. And uh, uh, also don't forget to check out creativelive.com slash audio for Ale's six or seven classes there, which are wealth of information. Thank you, guys. Cool. See you next time.